Good evening, everyone. Thank you. There's no microphone, but um, I believe that you all should be able to hear me and hopefully see me. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. This is a very proud moment, not only for me as the Dean of the School of Nursing, for my faculty, certainly for my students, as well as their families. This is what we call the Doctorate of Nursing Practice Completion Ceremony. Our students have just completed a doctorate in nursing practice that they started a little over two years ago, as I'm sure all of the loved ones in the room know all too well. The Doctorate of Nursing Practice is considered a terminal degree. It is the highest degree it's in the category of the highest degrees within the fields of nursing. Of course, there's a PhD, there are doctorates of nursing science, there is the doctorate of nursing practice. Some nurses even go on to get doctorates in education. But this is a degree that is very unique to Wagner College. We do not have any other doctoral programs here on campus. So we're very proud that we started this conversation a few years ago and it came to fruition. This is our third graduating cohort. They are all nurses in their own right. They are all nurse practitioners. Entry into this program requires that you are a nurse practitioner. So why would someone who is a nurse already, who is a nurse practitioner, who has many years experience, want to do a doctorate in nursing practice? Well, there's a variety of reasons. But I would think most importantly, that the 11 graduates that are here tonight chose to not only advance their own practice, but to add to the body of knowledge in nursing, and then hopefully go out with the research that they have done and the projects that they have completed and serve populations of great need. You will hear tonight a variety of topics that each student chose a topic, most commonly, with a population that has a considerable need. When we looked at a doctoral of nursing practice program, many are focused on a variety of aspects of what we do in the healthcare industry. But living in New York City, knowing the diversity, knowing the needs of our underserved areas, and knowing that, unfortunately, all too often populations are hit with many, many events that put them in crisis whether it be environmental, like a storm, whether it be an elderly group that is in need, or children. So I'm, I'm hoping that you will be able to understand that not only tonight did your loved ones complete another degree, but they are adding to global health and population health. We are asking our graduates to go forward with their projects, to present at conferences, to publish in journals of nursing or, nurse or, or journals of, of public health and, and many other journals. So we know that there are other nurses that will be out there and other healthcare practitioners that can benefit from the work that went on in the two and a half years. So thank you for all being here. It's a wonderful time for us. It's a wonderful time for families to celebrate and probably get a pretty good sigh of relief that your loved one may be around a little bit more because they won't be so bogged down trying to finish their doctoral degree. I'm so happy tonight that our president, Dr. Richard Garassi, was able to come down. I'm, I'm hoping for a little bit more than a few moments. This is a very hectic time of year. The Board of Trustees will be arriving early tomorrow and he'll be in meetings for a few days. But uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Garassi, our president at Wagner Thank College. You. Uh, let's give a round of applause for the Dean of the Nursing School. Thank you. Thank you. So I just, can I have the graduates sit, stand up? Can we, everyone is getting their degree. Can you stand up? Thank you so much. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to your families. I think Pat Tucker put it so beautifully. You're, you're, you're in a incredibly noble profession. There are so many families in need across all kinds of communities in New York and beyond. And to be in a profession where you can help people who are in physical need, 
help their families cope with situations, to help them get better, get well, is the, one of the greatest things you can do. So it's a great profession. I'm so proud of you in this program. I was so happy when we started the program. And I just want to hope you have a wonderful evening here. We have one special guest who I want to introduce, one of the finest people I ever worked with. Um, we have Curtis Wright, Dr. Dean Curtis Wright. He came back to visit. He's now the Vice President for Student Affairs at Xavier University in New Orleans. And he was a great partner here for 12 years. Yes, wonderful person. So he's happy. He came back for you. Well, for one of you, anyway. <laughs> so enjoy the evening. I'll be looking on as you get your, your certificate. And uh, thank you for choosing Wagner. And I hope that great success as you go forward. Thank you so much. Before I introduce Dr. Kathleen Ahern, who is really the force behind our Doctoral of Nursing Practice degree, I would like to thank the faculty, many who are here tonight, if you could please stand. The faculty of the Edwin Spiro School of Nursing. Tom Morrow, faculty. Ruta Shaw Gordon, one of our vice presidents. Of course, Curtis Wright is introduced. And our Associate Provost, Dr. Jeffrey Krause, is here as well. Thank you. Thank you for all for being here. I'd like to take a moment now to ask Dr. Kathleen Ahern to please come up and speak to the graduating class and their families. First, I would like to say how proud I am of each and every one of the graduates. It's really been a it's really been a journey for both of us, right? <laughs> and uh, and challenging, I know. But you really have done some tremendous, amazing work. And what is going to be expected of you really is more with the DNP, the doctoral degree. And we think of it in terms of that you know you're supposed to know now uh, more about delivering quality care about making changes and all. But I would like to ask you to keep in mind three things. Is that even though it's so important to challenge the status quo, it's not enough. What I think is really important is that you have integrity, you have professionalism, and you have humility. And we have seen in recent years that this has been challenged, especially in research and publications. So one of the things you really always want to remember to do in your professional life, and in your personal life, it's not a bad idea, is that when you make an error, own up to it. Make it yours. You know, don't, don't blame it on someone else. You know, that's, that's the mark of a professional. And a true professional shows consideration for others. A true professional is collegial. It's not just about, you know, you getting ahead with your career path. You know, what are you going to do to help someone else along the way? Because it's the ones we take along the way with us in our careers that really, at the end of the day, make the difference. And what does, you know, what does integrity mean? Integrity is something uh, that is so important. It's important whether you're a professional, no matter what your occupation is, but that you should be honest and that you should have adhere to a moral code. And, and that is really important. And the, the last thing I would like is that you keep in mind that it's important to be humble that there are still so many people out there you can learn from. <coughs> and they may not have the PhDs, the DNPs, they may not have the big titles, but they can still teach us a lot. So now, I, I promise to be brief. This is brief, right? Okay, <laughs> so be that better person. Be the person who demonstrates professionalism, integrity, and humility. And I know you will make us proud.
now, um, we're gonna, I'm actually going to call up each student and I'm going to give them just a few minutes, if that's okay with the student, so that they can just briefly explain to you the two and a half years that they spent here in the program and what their DMP capstone uh, project was, which is the final scholarly project of each student sitting here that's uh, at the ceremony tonight. So, Diana, since <laughs> Diana Davidovi uh, is first. Um, and very proud of each and every uh, topic of research that each student did. Uh, very many of the topics are emerging. Uh, as Diana's topic, you'll understand what I mean um, uh, when she explains it. Uh, and then many of them are uh, exciting because we hope the students are able to take these projects that they did for the last two and a half years and go forward and, and change policy uh, in the field of nursing. So, Thank you, everyone. Um, so my topic is about my topic is about uh, my project is about human trafficking, and um, I recognize that human trafficking is a major public and global uh, health emergency, and that has been uh, affecting many people um, all over the globe, and, and also known as uh, modern day, day slavery. I apologize for being a little nervous today. Um, an epidemic. It has continued to flourish despite um, the new anti-trafficking laws that are being implemented. Human trafficking is a violation to human rights. It's prevalent both domestically and internationally. There are two types of human trafficking. There is sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Both forms of human trafficking may use force, fraud, or coercion, psychological terror, and physical violence. Traffic victims are often come in contact with healthcare providers in given day, in any given day. Um, so my, my project is specializes for healthcare providers, and the main idea is to teach healthcare providers how to identify, treat, um, healthcare providers to actually find the victims and to make sure they provide all the necessary information to the victims of healthcare of uh, human trafficking. Thank you. Desena, uh, and Lori did a topic that has to do with disaster preparedness, which is part of our program uh, that includes also population health. And Lori will explain uh, briefly what her project was about, um, and then we'll give you a little bit. Hi. Um, I did deaf and hard of hearing and disaster preparedness. Um, after Sandy, some of you may know that there were some uh, difficulties that the deaf and hard of hearing had with services, uh, with evacuation, notification of the disaster, and um, the after effects. Um, so I did a survey of some people in the, in the deaf community um, and uh, found the results were that a lot of them are, don't feel that they're prepared. Uh, a lot of them don't have disaster, um, disaster plans in effect, like most of us probably don't. 60% is, uh, is what the literature shows. Um, so um, I looked into that and uh, came up with, uh, asked them what they felt that they needed um, uh, to, what they needed to know to be prepared for disaster. 
and they gave me some very good suggestions. Uh, some of them wanted some ideas of what to put in their go bag. Um, some of them just wanted uh, talked about different services that they wish were available to them. Um, so um, well, I'm going to work on that. And also, I came up with a card um, because of the differences with the literacy levels with those that are uh, ASL, a sign language. Um, the literacy levels are a little bit different. Um, so I came up with a card that's mostly pictures just to make it easier for just about anybody to understand. Um, and we'll be passing those out at um, the Deaf Club on Staten Island. They were nice enough to let me come in and do the survey there and um, at the Staten Island Club of the Deaf and at uh, Hands of Christ Church. Unfortunately, had a family emergency. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. Um, but um, her uh, DMP capstone project was on uh, assessing the awareness of healthcare providers, is particularly nurses, to be prepared to have to stay in a disaster uh, emergency uh, situation. How would they prepare to be able to stay? Like, what, what do they have uh, uh, in preparation for their own life? And it, it was very interesting to see that very few nurses had a plan in effect if they had to stay uh, long term due to uh, any man made or natural disaster. So she did a wonderful job. She works at Sloan Kettering, uh, and um, she's going further also with her project. So, unfortunately, we missed her our dearly. Um, the next student tonight is Gwendolyn Hernandez. And uh, Gwendolyn did her DMP capstone uh, project on uh, uh, assessing the, um, the awareness of freshman college students on um, um, sexually transmitted diseases and um, other healthcare related uh, outcomes. Um, so, Gwen. This is uh, how the cover of my book looks. Okay, I'm going to take a few breaths because I'm a little nervous. So good evening, everyone. My name is Gwendolyn Hernandez. I am the nurse practitioner that works out of the Center for Health and Wellness here at the college. Um, so I, my project is on evaluating the effectiveness or examining the effectiveness of an e-book in educating college students on sexual health promotion. Um, so when we look at the statistics that, are, that currently came out in 2017, it shows that there is a, a rise in the number and rates of STDs among adolescents in the age of 15 through 24 years old. When I saw that, I was alarmed because I said, wow, this is a population that I'm actually serving here on the campus, and that concerned me. Um, so what I did was I wrote this book, and it basically has all the information that a college student needs to know about sexual health. Um, what is nice about it is that even though in high school you learn about sex ed, um, sometimes you forget some of the information or you just need to be refreshed and that's what this big book does. Um, so when I conducted the study on campus, it went out on the student listserv. Uh, we have a total of around 2,000 students on campus. Um, my, my study went out to the whole entire campus. Um, so out of the 2,000 students that responded, um, well, out of the 2,000 students that received the invitation to do the study, 
I had a response rate of 147 students. So what I had to do was kind of eliminate only uh, the students that, well, I, I had to include only the students that were 18 through 19 years old because my target was to just reach all the freshman students. Um, so that was a little bit of a blunder uh, because everyone got the book. I, didn't, I don't think it was a blunder though because what I noticed is everyone needs to, just a refresher on, on sex ed. Um, so my results. Um, so out of the 27 students that I actually used uh, to conduct um, or to analyze the research, out of the 27, guess what I saw? I saw that there was an increase of knowledge gained from the pre-test to the post-test. Um, it was a significant increase. The pre-test, half the students uh, didn't do as well. But after reading my book, we had an increase of knowledge gained. And I must say that most of the students, more than half of the students in the post-test actually did well. Um, so I guess really what I want to say is that, well, what I learned from this study is that most students think that they know everything they need to know about sex. But what it showed was that, no, we need refresher. We need to learn more, especially about STDs, because there's so many STDs. And um, what I saw was that a lot of students needed more information and needed to learn more about how to not only prevent, but also protect themselves uh, against uh, the STDs. Um, and so, thank you for your time. And that we've actually had in the program since 2011, and boy are we going to miss him. Um, his name is Brosnan Irandi, and Brosnan did an amazing uh, uh, project that was global in nature. He actually did his DMP capstone project uh, in Nigeria, and what he did was he put a communication system in place to increase the health and, uh, and wellness of the population in Nigeria. So I would like to please introduce Brosnan Irandi. Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. Yeah, my, my project, um, like she said, is international. So um, I implemented what is called SPA communication framework. So that SPA stands for Situation, Background, um, and Re Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. So actually, it's well used in the United States, but um, it's not um, well known like in places like Nigeria. So normally, um, here in the United States, um, it's well used in, in healthcare. But if I had to do that project in Nigeria, and if I did it in healthcare, it's so difficult to teach an old dog new tricks. So for that reason, I decided to take it to a nursing school where I implemented it in, in the final year class and we put it in the curriculum. So what happened is that at the end of um, that project, they became knowledgeable about what it is to report a um, patient um, condition because worldwide communication has been a problem in healthcare. So having said that, we now have it in the, in the school curriculum right now, and um, we'll be monitoring, and uh, it's just a pilot project. And in the end, I still intend to um, take it one step further, and uh, maybe implement it in other schools that are around the area. Thank you.
UP student has also been with us since 2011, also going to be greatly missed. I, I should point out that many of the students in the room have been with us at Wagner for their undergrad uh, degree, their graduate degree, and now their DMP degree. So we're very thankful for that, and, and, we, and we thank you very much for, for staying with us and, and um, working with us. Um, the next student's name is Marcel Kagan. Uh, he actually did a project uh, and received a grant for his project uh, from the Stephen Silla Foundation. Um, that's a famous foundation here on the island who uh, uh, passed um, from 9-11, um, carrying his equipment through the tunnel um, to save lives. So uh, this young man uh, uh, wrote, wrote a grant, um, received uh, grant money, did a wonderful job on uh, doing a uh, project where he was uh, educating and instructing uh, nurses on how to prevent uh, unnecessary infections and deaths with uh, uh, invasive Lyme placements because he works in a surgical intensive care environment. So, Marcel, please come up. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for everybody coming. It's great that we have such an amazing support system and families and faculty. For everyone, I just wanted to say thank you and echo that. Um, my project is on ultrasonography um, and vascular access and educating nurse practitioner students. I felt that there was a strong component in healthcare where we have the knowledge and the ability to understand ultrasonography and how to utilize it in different uh, avenues such as um, assessment, uh, access, line placement, etc. Um, what I found in literature, and I focused on that there was a gap of nursing education regarding um, ultrasonography and vascular access. How many times do we go to the doctor's office and they, you know, we can't get labs stuck and it's very difficult? And I noticed that patient satisfaction is very poor um, with you know, phlebotomy, etc. So I, I realized that there's such a lack of knowledge in this field, and it actually showed in my study when I educated nurse practitioners, and it's nurse practitioner students, and it's amazing in one hour that I got them to increase their level of knowledge on each question by over 35%. And it, that was just in one hour. And if I take this further and implement it into the community where I'm able to then have students learn this in an eight hour module curriculum, the knowledge factor can increase and gain and we can really sustain an optimal healthcare community with great outcomes. And this is, can be used in a tertiary setting, secondary setting, primary setting. Um, so I felt like ultrasonography was such an important component. And now that we have, it, it's a portable tool that can be utilized and can be put in our pockets. And so many various healthcare professions, I hope to expand it further where I could, you know, educate EMTs on how to gain access placement really quickly, how to educate um, phlebotomy techs on getting labs, utilizing it in dialysis to save the AV fistulas. So this topic is such a passion of mine and I feel like it, it's, I'm really thankful and honored that I was giving the resources here at Wagner to implement it to the community and I feel like moving forward I'm not going to stop and I'm going to continue it to grow so I hope you will be hearing more about ultrasonography from me. Christina Clemez, though she should, we should have Christina Clemez. Spina. Spina, good, we should put that on. Christina's been married uh, almost a year now. Um, Christina also is a student that's been with us since 2011 here at <coughs> Wagner College. She did her undergraduate, her uh, family nurse practitioner degree, and now her DMP degree with Wagner College. And again, we thank you, Christina. Uh, Christina did a very interesting project also in the disaster preparedness uh, portion of our program. She did radiation exposure to see how the uh, advanced practice nurses prepared. Uh, and it was very interesting, her uh, work, and she will be presenting it. 
with uh, one of uh, our student, Luva Reeves, who I haven't introduced yet. They'll be presenting their work in Washington uh, 2019. So we're very proud of them. Hi, my name is Christina Clemas Spina, and I focused on nuclear radiation disasters and emergencies. Throughout history, nurses have been key responders to disasters throughout the world. And with research, it showed that there was a lack of knowledge amongst healthcare providers and the community on these types of disasters. Therefore, it created an educational website to be used as a resource and a guide for healthcare providers. And hopefully, it will be used in the future. Thank you. DMP student is Marianne O'Connor, and uh, Marianne was new to us. Um, uh, she had not been to Wagner before. We are blessed to have uh, known Marianne and her colleague Patty, who unfortunately is not here tonight. But they've made uh, uh, it's, it's been a friendship and a, a relationship. I hope you continue because we, we will miss both of you uh, quite a bit. She, um, she always made me laugh. Um, uh, Marianne uh, did uh, great work. Uh, she works in uh, a surgical field that deals with pain management. Uh, I will have her explain her project, but she did a very, very interesting, uh, innovative project and will continue her work. She also works at Soul Kevin. practitioner at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, I've been in uh, anesthesia pain service for about eight years. And I, um, the reason why I did do my project is I took um, a lichen and had noticed that um, uh, neuropathic pain, which is nerve um, pain and damage post uh, breast surgery and mastectomy was um, needed for um, treatment care. So what I did is I developed a uh, clinical pathway, a um, algorithm, educational tool to help um, educate the staff, the nursing staff at uh, Sloan Kettering, and hopefully to move on and um, use it, and the outside regional uh, breast centers at Memorial Sloan Kettering, to educate uh, further what treatment options are available and medications that are available and um, if resources are needed to contact um, the pain service. Thank you. student has also been with us since 2011, undergrad degree, FMP degree, and now DMP degree. Her name is Luba Reeves, uh, another sweetheart. Each student, is, they're all sweethearts, this group. We're going to miss them terribly. Uh, Luba did her project on the uh, evaluation and assessment of uh, advanced practice uh, health care providers to realize uh, um, the incidents of uh, flood water uh, um, illnesses and diseases that occur after a natural disaster. And a lot of her work was reflected from the uh, unfortunate hurricane in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, a lot of it is new information. She will also be presenting her work in Washington. Again, we're very proud of her. She did another fantastic job. So Louvre, please come up. Um, 
my project was actually um, flood disasters, what lurks in the water, that's the title. What I wanted to create was a program that would provide information on flood disasters and all the diseases that could come up after them. What I created was a web program, an educational web program in which um, healthcare providers were help, able to get into this web program, go over the information that I provided them after extensive research through all the government sites. I put together a complete table with all the medications, all the antibiotics, everything that could be possibly used in order to provide care for these uh, different health, um, healthcare diseases. Um, I created also a pilot study with students here at school, and they participated in the program. And for the result, I, uh, we find out that they did increase knowledge in the information that I have provided them in this web program. So the web program really worked. And I hope that in the future, I'll be able to provide this web program to other healthcare providers and uh, you know, help with assisting them in having this information at hand when they need it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. student is Marjorie Shane. Marjorie works as a nurse practitioner in a long-term care facility. Um, she had a passion about putting a program together, a real program that would change uh, policy and practices on uh, to reduce antibiotic resistance. So without further, I will introduce Marjorie Shane. Everybody. So my project is about antimicrobial stewardship in long-term care facilities and I focused on suspected urinary tract infections. So I developed an internet-based um, e-learning course for nurse practitioners and other health care providers in long-term care facilities um, because antibiotic resistance is a major public health problem and unfortunately elderly institutionalized individuals are at increased risk um, of um, antibiotic resistance infections due to like their age, institutionalized living, um, and they're also vulnerable to complications from unnecessary or inappropriate antibiotic use. So in nursing homes, the, the CDC found that 75% of antibiotics prescribed are actually done so inappropriately. So my goal with this project was to educate healthcare providers about improving the diagnosis of urinary tract infections and in which situations to avoid using antibiotics um, and ways to improve communication with nurses um, about nurse home residents with suspected urinary tract infections. So I'm also happy to report that there was a st statistically significant increase in the knowledge between the pre and the post tests that I used for the study. And I was fortunate to have the opportunity to present my project at the Unity Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So. Our last, 
uh, student to be announced. Uh, her name is Renata Zink. Uh, Renata um, did an amazing uh, uh, body of work on a project that's very personal to her. Uh, and, it's, and it's a topic that uh, actually you've heard of um, currently, a lot of people are affected of. Renata did her project to make, make sure healthcare professionals are now able to recognize this condition and uh, it's on celiac disease. So without further, Renata, please come. So I did my project about celiac disease in an adult patient. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease and um, as many as 3 million people in America have celiac disease, yet only 17% of people are diagnosed and 83% of patients remain undiagnosed. So um, celiac disease is compared to the iceberg when the top of the iceberg represents those patients who are diagnosed and the bottom of the iceberg represents those patients who are undiagnosed. Why are those patients undiagnosed? So as I did my research review, I found that healthcare providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants do not know the symptoms of celiac disease, and um, those patients remain, remain undiagnosed. Um, the reason for it is because in the past, celiac disease was considered a wasting disease. It affected mostly young children. And those children had classic presentation of diarrhea, muscle wasting, um, and abdominal pain, short stature. Now, with the time, the symptoms of celiac disease have shifted to non-classical symptoms. And a lot of patients who come to the doctors, they have variety of symptoms, such as they may complain of joint pain, miscarriages, infertility, anemia, they, have, they can have skin rash, seizures, and many healthcare providers do not link those symptoms to celiac disease, and those patients remain undiagnosed. As, as long as 13 years uh, has to pass until a patient is diagnosed. Now, why is it important for those patients to be diagnosed? It's because um, undiagnosed <coughs> patients who does not follow gluten-free diet will suffer complications such as cancers, anemia, osteoporotic fractures. Um, so for my project, I developed um, an educational module for healthcare providers in primary care in a form of a webinar. And this webinar contains all information that healthcare providers need to know to diagnose patients with celiac disease and uh, initiate the proper treatment. Uh, this celiac disease module um, was evaluated here for effectiveness and um, nurse practitioner students who um, watched the webinar increased knowledge about symptoms of celiac disease and uh, risk factors and treatment. Um, this educational program was also um, verified by Dr. Green, who is the professor at Columbia University and director of Celiac Disease Center. He checked this webinar to make sure I put in the proper information. And after that, it was um, I published it on YouTube, so it's available for all healthcare providers in primary care, so they can um, watch it and it can be a resource for them to diagnose patients. Um, I also presented my project at uh, Nurse Practitioner Conference in Atlanta. would like to take a group photo of all of the students but before you do that because he'd like to take it at the brick wall in the back I'd like to just personally acknowledge a few people in the room that had a lot to do with the students success uh, first I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Kathleen Falk 
If you could please stand. Dr. John Denisi. Dr. John, Dr. Denisi. Dr. Donald Stearns. Scientist Elaine Mockey. Professor Tom Morrow. Doris Corona and uh, I know I know we mentioned Curtis already but we really appreciate and 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 Ruta too we really appreciate all your support that you give the students thank you very much apologize on behalf of a busy schedule and maybe a little bit of miscommunication. We really should have had a microphone here so that you could really hear everyone much more clearly. But I'm relying on Lee Manchester's videoing talents and that all of this will be captured and you'll be able to watch that certainly on our uh, Wagner website. Lori? Yeah, just before you end, we just have a little presentation you'd like to do, if that's okay. Okay. What would you say? Um, the night is not over. There is still plenty of little picking foods. Please, please, please stay, celebrate. There are some uh, soda, water, and even some sangria off to the side. We're not chasing folks out. We want people to relax and celebrate. But this does conclude our ceremony with, with uh, the exception of uh, what Dr. DeSena would like to say. And thank you all for being here. Have a happy and healthy holiday season and drive safely. Thank you, Thank you I will get it for you, Tom. But we wanted to present Tom with an honorary doctorate. <laughs> uh, he has educated so many of us. Um, and so we kind of an honorary doctorate. So, sorry, no money involved, just a certificate. <laughs> but that was it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.